Welcome to the next episode. In this episode, we will discuss the maximum displacement of the vessel and the maximum weight capacity we're allowed to carry with the boat. This is going to be a rather long episode because although the concept is simple, the details are many. So I will try to get through this as clearly and as quickly as I can. Imagine you had an empty bucket and you set that on the floor and then you filled it with water. Then you inserted a pipe through the side of the bucket so if the water level rose just a little bit it would come out the pipe and fall to the floor. So let's put an empty bucket, a smaller one here, to catch any overflow. Now let's say we had a cube that measured one cubic foot in volume. So it's one foot by one foot by one foot. And we place the cube inside the bucket. Now what is going to happen to the water that's in here? As we push that cube down in there, the water level will rise and pour out the pipe into our side bucket, like that. Now how much water do you think would come out of the big bucket and flow into our empty bucket on the side? Well, it turns out if our cube is what has a volume of one cubic foot, then one cubic foot of water will flow out. One cubic foot of water will be displaced by our cube and one cubic foot of fresh water at standard temperature weighs 62.4 pounds. So one cubic foot will flow out because that's the volume of our cube and it'll weigh 62.4 pounds. Archimedes came up with a principle that says a body totally or partially immersed in a fluid is subject to an upward force equal in magnitude to the weight of fluid it displaces. So since this cube displaces one cubic foot of water which weighs 62.4 pounds we would have to push down on this block to keep it under the water. Now if the block doesn't weigh much, let's say it weighs nothing, zero, then we would have to push the full 62.4 pounds down on this block to hold it under water. Now this, our, this principle is, is a foundation to boat design. And we're going to use it today in determining the maximum displacement for our boat and the safe amount we can carry with it. So let's get started. Let's say we had a boat and it was weightless. In other words, we're going to ignore the weight of the vessel. It would float exactly on the water, like right above the water like that. Now if we push down on it, we can push straight down on it until the water is just about ready to flow over the gunnel. And just prior to that coming on board, that is the maximum displacement of this vessel if we pushed straight down on it. Now we could push the boat more on the aft end and push it down under the water like this and now the water is about ready to flow in over the back of the transom. So which do you think is displacing more water? This boat here or this boat? Well, the amount of water being displaced is equal to the volume of the boat under the water line. Well clearly there's a lot more volume of the boat under the water line in this example on the left. So as the designer of the boat what we are trying to find is the maximum displacement that the boat can displace, the maximum amount of water, and that would be this case over here. Now it gets a little tricky. Another way we could push down on the boat is push down on it so the bow and stern are an equal distance above or below the water line. Now in this case the water line is well over the gunnel and the boat would flood. So we need to bring this up a bit until the water line is even with the gunnel, like this. So now our bow and stern are an equal distance above the water line, 
and the volume we're displacing is equal to the volume of the boat underneath this water line. This water line is called the static float plane when we've got the boat just on the verge of swamping. Now in the first case here we just push straight down on it keeping the bottom level and in the second case we kept the bow and stern an equal distance above the water line. The Coast Guard allows you to use either of these two approaches provided the bow is above the highest point of ingress of water like in this case the water is going to come in over the gunnel here and the bow is higher than that point this is a legal um, configuration and having the bow and stern an equal distance above the water with the water about ready to flow over this portion of the gunnel is also uh, acceptable so you can choose either one of these I'm choosing to use the example on the right. Now the definition of maximum displacement, which is what we want to calculate, it's the weight, so in pounds, of the volume of water displaced by the boat at its maximum immersion in calm water without water coming aboard. So exactly what I've shown here. Now let's say we take our boat and we can stretch a string line, this yellow line, from the bow to the stern. That would be our static float plane, but we know since the string line is above the gunnel, the boat would flood. So we need to move this string line down parallel to this line like this. That is the static float plane we would want to use in calculating the volume of the boat. We want to know the volume of the boat underneath this second yellow line. It turns out in our boat we will need to shift this string line down three inches. So let me show you how I came up with that in real life. Here's the boat and I've attached the string line to the to the deck, top of the deck, right at the front of the boat. It turns out that it was just touching the combing, nice and convenient, and then I'm stretching the string aft towards the transom. So here it is, and it's just touching the top of the splash well, and then I've attached it or clamped it here to a board that I've also clamped vertically to the transom. And the left edge or the port side of this board is right on the center line of the boat. So that is our initial yellow uh, line in the previous cartoon, that top yellow line. But as you notice, if I put a level across the side of the boat, this static float plane or this string is well above what it would take to swamp the boat. So we need to lower this string line, and it turns out it was three inches from here to here. So I, so I lowered the string line three inches at the bow and at the stern. So now this string line, this is where it originally was on this board clamped on the stern. By moving our static float plane down three inches, now the static float plane is actually just a quarter inch underneath this transom cutout. So the, that's saying this splash well would ideally not swamp with water which they usually do and you need sub to subtract this volume of water from your displacement calculations. But in our case, since we're using a long shaft motor and the way we've defined the static uh, float plane, we're, we're just underneath that transom notch. So it makes our calculations easier. So here's a level that I've uh, placed across the boat. This is with the string line lowered three inches and it's just touching the bottom of the level. So, and I moved the level all the way forward and all the way back and it kept, uh, it was either just touching the string line or there was a gap. So that means the boat would not swamp or take on water if the, if the water level was at that string line. Then I attached a little bubble level, a string level, onto my string and I raised the boat and put uh, these foam blocks underneath there so that the string line was level forward to aft. And I also put my level across the boat 
and shimmed either side until the boat was level transversely and our static float plane represented by the string is level fore and aft. So now the boat is in the attitude that it would be just before uh, swamping. So the volume of the boat underneath that string line is what we want to determine. That's the maximum displacement for our vessel. So here's the diagram again, cartoon. This is what we have. We have the boat in this attitude in the garage and I now have the string line at the static float plane that we're interested in. The next thing you want to do is find the mid height of the transom, which these, these distance, distances represented by these red arrows are equal distances. And there's a reason you want to do this, and I'll show you. So if you were to measure forward from the bow to the transom, we will, you would get 187 and a quarter for our boat, but that's not the length we're interested in. We're interested in the length at the static float plane. So you would, it's pretty clear you would measure from here where the static float plane intersects the bow, but you would think you would measure all the way back here where the static float plane intersects the transom. But the Coast Guard suggests actually measuring to this midpoint, mid-height point of the transom. Because they're saying it's, it's, it's easier to treat the transom as if it's vertical instead of sloped like this. And if you go to the midpoint of the height of the transom, then you would be treating the bow as if it had a vertical transom right at this green line. And so you would be ignoring the additional volume you have from this triangle, but that equals the additional triangle you're adding to the bow by making the transom straight up and down. So these little triangles uh, counteract each other, and so that's what allows us to treat the transom as vertical at this point, the mid-height. It turns out for our bow that from the bow back to this line is two inches and from the transom to this line is two inches so a total of four inches shorter than the overall length so four inches off of this is the 183 and a quarter so here I am measuring all the way from the bow to the transom and you get the 187 and a quarter we talked about then this line right here where my laser pointer is that's where the static float plane is our string line it's a quarter inch below this transom cutout this line down here that you can just make out is the bottom of the boat and then this line is that mid height so this distance here is equal to this distance here and so I measured from the back of the transom to a level that I've plumbed to the back of the boat and found that that was two inches so I need to make that measurement, that shorter measurement, starting two inches forward of the back of the transom. So I know the transom is an inch and a half thick and I want to measure two inches forward. So I just added a half inch scrap piece of plywood here to make the total distance from here to here two, two inches. So that's where our measurement starts to calculate the length of the boat at the static float plane. I hope that makes sense. So there we are again. The front of that plywood, scrap plywood, represents this green line right here. And then the other green line is two inches short of the very front of the boat. And that's our 183 and a quarter. Now what I want to do, I'm not, I'm not going to calculate the cross-sectional area of our boat at each inch along this boat. That would be ridiculous. Uh, I decided to divide it into six equal spaces. So I'm going to make stations. If you take the 183 and a quarter, which is this distance right here, and divide by six, you get 30.54. So I'm going to find stations every 30.54 inches. So there's one station, there's another, 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 and they're each 30.54 inches apart. So here I am, back on the boat, and I've put a level 
parallel to our string line. You can see the bubble is level because I know our string line is level. And I'm picking off the point at the front of our plywood. That's where our 183 and a quarter starts and I make a mark on the level. Then I took what I call a tick stick. This tick stick I cut to 30.54 inches. The spacing we want between our stations. And I laid the aft end of it on the mark we made, which represents the front of this block. So 30.54 inches forward, I dropped a plumb bob off our level, down to the bottom of the boat, and I looked where it hit our string line and made a mark on this horizontal string line with a sharpie. That is our first station in front of the transom. The remaining stations are easy to measure. You just take the, the tick stick, put the aft end on that mark, and mark the forward end, and continue all the way to the bow. So I don't know if you can make it out in the picture, but we have a station back here, and this little black mark is the next station forward, and here's a black mark right here, marking the, indicating the next station forward. So now we have all our stations. We are, uh, our transom one is at the mid height of the transom. We're treating the boat as it, as it has a flat, as if it has a flat vertical transom. Then every 30.54 inches we have a station. So the bow station is that 183 and a quarter. Now again, our string line is representing the static float plane where the water level would be. So we want to find the cross-sectional area of the vessel below this static float plane at each one of these stations represented by the green lines. So we're going to have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven stations. Now let's just take uh, one station and let me show you how you calculate the cross-sectional area or what I mean by that. So if I rotate this towards us like a book 90 degrees or in other words if you were looking forward standing back here on the boat and looking forward here is the shape you would see so this is the bottom of the boat and this is the sides of the boat and the yellow line is the static float plane the orange line is the center line of the boat where the string runs right down the middle of the boat CL is for center line so how do we calculate the area of this shape underneath the yellow line well, there's three measurements you need. You first need the height from the bottom to the static float plane. We'll call that H. And you need the half breadth from the center line to the side of the boat at the static float plane. We'll call that A. And you need the dimension from the center line to the side of the boat along the bottom. We'll call that B. So the area of this half, there's an equation for it, and it looks like this. I call it the half breadth area because it's half the area underneath the static float plane. And it's equal to one half A plus B. Well, one half A plus B is just the average of A plus B. So it's going to be a distance that's halfway up from here over to the center line. That's what one half A plus B is. And we multiply that average width times the height H and we'll get the area of this half underneath the static float plane. So one half A plus B times H. Well we want the area of both sides of the boat. So we want the full area. So we need to multiply this half breadth area by two. Well two times one half is two halves. Two halves is one. So the full area underneath the static float plane for the shape of our hull, we just need to take A plus B times H and we get the cross-sectional area of the boat underneath the static float plane at this station. And we need to do that, repeat that, for the other stations. So let me show you how I measured this in real life on our boat. So here is one particular station and I've put the level across the boat and I've measured from the transom to the level to make sure that it is perpendicular, lying perpendicular across the boat and perpendicular to this string line representing our static float plane and also the center line of the boat. And then I dropped a plumb bob down and I'll make a mark 
on the level just with a pencil so I can erase it later representing where the center of the boat is and then by dropping this plumb bob I can then take a ruler like this and measure parallel to the plumb bob string and get the height h from the bottom up to the static float plane in this case we're 27 and 3 quarters however we want the dimension to the outside of the boat to the bottom of the boat well our bottom panel has a thickness of 3 quarters of an inch so I will eventually add 3 quarters of an inch to this and this will be a final dimension or a corrected dimension of 28 and a half the next thing I do is I want to get those half breadths so I want from the center line out to the side of the boat along the bottom of the boat well I just drop a plumb bob down until it hits this crease or this chine well you'll notice that the plumb bob will actually hit the side of the boat before the tip of it can reach that crease so I just stood up a little 2 by 4 on its side with this edge of it right up against that crease and it's vertical on this face so all I gotta do is have the plumb bob touch that edge of the 2x4 and I know I'm there and I make a mark right here on my level so when I measure from that mark to the center line mark I will have that dimension B from the center line to the side of the bow at the bottom then I took a square and extended the rule until it just touched the string line then I moved that square over to the outboard side of the boat and touch the side of the boat with it that is where I want to make a mark right here on the level and then from this mark to the center line is dimension A the distance or the width of the boat the half breadth width at the static float plane I'm using this plywood half inch plywood shim because the lower dimension was to the inside of the plywood and I wanted the upper half breadth to be consistent with it so I'm just treating as if this half inch plywood comes all the way up to uh, the top edge of the gunnel now later I added a half inch to both of these dimensions the half breadth at the bottom and at the top to get uh, the outside of the side panel we want that we want the dimensions to the outside of the boat so here we are this is the same diagram and here's the stations the transom is at zero and the bow is at 183 and a quarter and here's all our dimensions and I've for all the dimensions a I've added a half inch to account for the thickness of this the plywood on the sides same thing to dimension B the half breadth at the bottom and then all the shear heights I added three quarters of an inch to account for the thickness of the bottom panel here are all the dimensions now at the bow we're treating as if the boat comes to a point there so there is no uh, everything zero there there's no width and there's no height because it, it's just a single point at the bow now we can calculate our full areas using our equation a plus b times the height we just take a plus b times this number in this column and we get the area so the area at the transom was calculated to be 1218 or 1218 square inches and then it was a bit more at the station in front of it and it gets a bit more at the next station and then it starts dropping down as we get towards the bow now this is the cross-sectional area of the boat at each one of these green stations so I can plot that so here is the station in inches so the bow is up here at 183 and a quarter and the transom is here at zero and then I can plot the cross-sectional area of the boat so at the transom it was between a thousand and fifteen hundred square inches and then it increased and then it started to drop off as we move to the bow now we want to see that this has somewhat of a nice curvature to it if one of these dots was way down here then I know I probably made an error in my calculations so this is a way to check that 
you didn't make any mistakes. Now, since these the vertical axis is the cross-sectional area of the boat in square inches, and the horizontal axis is the length in inches, well, if you multiply area times length, you get volume. So the area under this curve is the volume of water displaced by the vessel below the static float plane. So how can we calculate the area underneath this curve? How can we estimate it? Well, one way would be treating each one of these as a trapezoid. And so you, we know how to calculate the area of the trapezoid. It's just the average height times this interval width. So we can make a trapezoid there and there. Well, we're, we're really underestimating the volume of the boat by ignoring this little slice here. Again, also making, we're, we're short of what we really are if we use this approach. And that's better. And that's pretty good estimate there, and that's pretty decent. So this is called the trapezoidal rule to determine the area under a curve. And this is the equation. So the trapezoidal rule, you would do this. Our interval, our distance between these intervals, remember, was 30.54 inches, and you divide by 2, and then you multiply by this quantity here, which is your area at station 1, at your first station plus two times the area at this station, 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 plus zero. There's no area at the front of the boat. So you do the math on that and you get 240,391 whopping cubic inches. Well, a cubic foot is 12 inches times 12 inches times 12 inches. Well, 12 times 12 is 144, times 12 is 1728. So if you divide this number that's cubic inches divided by 1728, you will get the volume displaced by the boat in cubic feet. So we would calculate it here as 139.1 cubic feet using the trapezoidal rule. There is a better approximation called the Simpson's Rule. And the Simpson's Rule uses three points on your curve and it fits a parabola to those points. And then it looks at the next three points and fits a parabola to it and then looks at the final three points and makes a parabola to it. So you're essentially estimating this curve with three different parabolas and calculating the area under those. Well, you see, that's a much better approximation. And the rule looks very much like the trapezoidal rule, except you divide by 3 here instead of 2. And then you use the first area multiplied by 4 times the second area instead of 2 times, plus 2 times the next area, plus 4 times the next area, plus 2 times the next plus four times the next plus zero. So instead of going uh, one, two, 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 and then one at your end, you're doing one, four, two, four, two, four, one. So running that, we get a little bit more volume, uh, 242,284 cubic inches. Dividing by 1728, we get 140.2 cubic feet, which is a little over one cubic foot than what we calculated before. And this is probably a much more accurate way to do it. And if you use the Simpsons rule, you just have to remember that your intervals, uh, your number of intervals has to be even. That's why I broke the boat into six intervals. You have to use an even number, six, eight, ten, something like that. Six is sufficient accuracy for this boat we're building, I think. So the volume displaced below the static float plane is 140.2 cubic feet per the Simpsons rule. Well, fresh water weighs 62.4 pounds per cubic feet. So the maximum displacement of the vessel, remember that's the weight of water we displace, 
would be 140.2 cubic feet times 42.4 pounds per cubic feet gives us 8,749 pounds. So what is that number? Well, if we push the boat down into the water like this until the, the water line is right even with the gunnel and the bow and stern or transom are equal distance above the water, then we are estimating it would take a force of 8,749 pounds to push the boat down to that level. Now this ignores the weight of the boat. So if the boat was weightless, that's how many pounds we would have to put in here or push down to get the boat to swamp. Now the Coast Guard is not going to let you load your boat up to that much weight. They have a safety factor. So let's get to that next. So the maximum displacement, these are definitions, that's what we just calculated, the weight in pounds, that 8,000 plus number, of the volume of water displaced by the boat at its maximum level of immersion in calm water without water coming aboard. So right to the point it's about to swamp. Well the Coast Guard says the maximum weight capacity, the maximum weight you can carry on the boat, the weight marked on the boat that is designed or intended to use as an outboard motor for propulsion must be a number that does not exceed one-fifth of the difference between the maximum displacement and the boat weight. What? Well, you take your maximum displacement, you subtract the weight of your boat, and you take that number and divide by five, and that's how much the Coast Guard will let you carry in the boat. So let's calculate it. So the maximum displacement of the vessel, we determined that before, is this many pounds. And per the Coast Guard, which if you want to know the details, it's Title 33 of the Code of Federal Regulations, 183.35, basically says the maximum weight capacity you can carry in this type of boat. Now remember, this is for boats that are no more than 20 feet long and powered by an outboard that's greater than two horsepower and uh, it is a single haul boat so it's not a catamaran or anything like that so the equation for it is you take your max displacement subtract the boat weight divide by five so I have three spring scales and I put this one underneath the bow and each of these underneath the corners in the back of the boat under the transom So I found that the scale at the front read 214 pounds and the scales in the back, the one on the port side, read 181 and the starboard scale read 184. So the total weight at the transom is 365 pounds. So the total weight I have for the boat using our scales is 214 plus this 365 at the back equaling a total of 579 pounds for the boat weight. Now this is something I do, it is not required by the Coast Guard, but I add 10% to allow for growth in the weight of the boat. As boats get older, they get heavier. They may get waterlogged, you may add more varnish or paint. You may bolt on a few items to this boat. Uh, you might add flotation to it. Uh, and so on and so forth. So I add 10% and I come up with a boat weight of 637 pounds. This growth allowance is just allowing us to be a bit conservative to consider the full life cycle of the vessel. So here's our numbers. We've calculated the maximum displacement of the vessel as that. We have a boat weight of 637 pounds, and here's our equation per the regulations. So plugging in the numbers, the maximum weight capacity is at 8,749 max displacement minus the 637 pound boat weight divided by five is 1,622 pounds. That is the maximum the Coast Guard says this boat is allowed to carry inshore in protected waters on a calm day. Where does this number go? Let me show you. 
Do you remember the Coast Guard sticker that's on the back of your boat? Well, there's a line on there that gives the maximum pounds for all the people aboard, your motor, and all the cargo or gear you're carrying. That 622 pounds goes right there. Now, we don't have to put 622. We can put a number less than this on our boat if we wanted to rate it, derate it to carry less weight. But we can't go over that number. So that is the maximum we're allowed to put on the sticker on that line. Now, in following episodes, we will go over what it takes to get these other numbers here. But this video has gone on far too long, but I think it's important if you're going to get into boat building that you know the details of, of doing this and how to, how to compute it right in your garage. All right, that's it. So we will talk to you in the next episode. Enjoy and God bless.